Hello my friends and welcome to the Curate Study for this the final Sunday in Advent. My name is Reverend Mark Kerslake and no matter who you are, where you are or what you believe, it's great to have you with me here this morning, even if it's only for a short time. So a week away, less than a week away in fact, it's Christmas and a very different sort of Christmas perhaps for some people. So perhaps this year people will have spent a bit less money on Christmas as shops have been shut. That probably isn't a bad thing. But I know for a fact that some people will be more isolated than ever as Christmas approaches. I get a sense from many people in our rural parishes that there is a palpable sense of anxiety. They feel as though it's almost a race between the virus and the vaccine. And on top of all that, of course, the good old papers and the press are doing their usual share of doom mongering not just about the virus, but also about Brexit, another uh, train looming on the horizon. But when you stop to think about it, perhaps it's a little bit like the first Christmas. You see, for many of us, Christmas has become a bit of a twee a r a religious festival, hasn't it? In fact, r religion is being gradually edged out of it, as far as many people are concerned. It's all warm and cosy and fuzzy, and there's nothing wrong with that, of course. But the first Christmas wouldn't have been like that at all. The first Christmas was a group of people who were living in a brutally subjugated country, a country that had been invaded by the Romans. It was a perilously long journey that the young couple, Mary and Joseph, would embark upon. A young girl giving birth for the first time, frightened and far from her family. A couple together in a basic shelter, a stable, no medical care, and no help coming. It was a simple Christmas. It was a quiet Christmas. But it was still a wonderful and a glorious Christmas. Because that's the truth of Christmas. No matter what our physical circumstances are, if Jesus is at the centre of what we do and what we believe, there will still be wonder and joy. Our collect for today then, as we begin, for this the fourth Sunday of Advent, God our Redeemer, who prepared the Blessed Virgin Mary to be the mother of your Son, grant that, as she looked for his coming as our Saviour, so we may be ready to greet him, when he comes again as our Judge, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And it's time for our short period of confession now, that moment on our Sunday services where we bring before God those things that have piled up over the course of the previous seven days or perhaps longer, those things that we are rightly ashamed and we've fallen short of behaving in a way that God would ask of us. And we do that by bringing them openly to God, knowing that when we do with a penitent uh, heart, he will always forgive us. So, Father God, you asked for my hands that might, you might use them for your purpose. I gave them for a moment, then withdrew them, for the work was hard. You asked for my mouth to speak out against injustice. I gave you a whisper that I might not be accused. You asked for my eyes to see the pain of poverty. I closed them, for I did not want to see. You asked for my life that you might work through me. I gave a small part that I might not get too involved. Lord, forgive my calculated efforts to serve you only when it is convenient for me to do so, only in those places where it is safe for me to do so, and only with those who make it easy for me to do so. Father, forgive me. Renew me. Send me out as a usable instrument that I might take seriously the meaning of your cross. Amen. And now, my almighty God, who in Jesus Christ has given us a kingdom that cannot be destroyed, forgive us our sins and open our eyes to God's truth. Strengthen us to do God's will and give us the joy of his kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I am particularly pleased now to announce our first hymn. So I don't know if you were, if you logged on to watch our Zoom carol service, which is also available actually on the YouTube channel from the Curate Study.
But we ran our carol service this year in conjunction with the amazing Tail Valley Choir. And they have been kind enough to send me the audio recordings of the carols that they sang in our carol service. And we're going to have some of them today. Now, there are no lyrics with them, um, but I will include the lyrics in the description box, which is underneath this. Um, and if you wish to sing along, mind you, to be fair, I suspect that most of us know the, the words of the carols pretty well anyway. But I think it's worth it just to have the beautiful Tail Valley Choir full of local people uh, who have done so much with our churches to serenade us today in our Sunday service. So it's time for Once in Royal David City. Now it's time for our Bible reading, which this morning is from the book of Luke. So it's Luke's Gospel, chapter 1, beginning at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favoured one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words, and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God, and now you, he, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now... 
your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived the son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. And then the angel departed from her. So now time for a, a reflection on what we've just heard. Allegedly, when the author, uh, J.K. Rowling, first wrote the Harry Potter series, she took it to any number of different publishers who said, nah, no thanks, I don't think so, before she finally got someone to agree to print it. And apparently also, for those of us who are old enough to remember them, the Beatles themselves had a tough job getting a record company to sign them up. Now, I don't know anything about these people, and some of them have faded a bit into history, and others are perhaps a little bit less famous than they were before, but how mortifying for those other folks who said no to them. I bet they could have thought about that no so many times. I wonder how many times the various publishers looked back in their conversation with J.K. Rowling and thought, oh, if only I had just said yes. So many of life's stories are boiled down to a simple yes or no, aren't they? One simple choice at one point in our lives, for example, which then starts a chain reaction which takes us to places we could never possibly imagine. In fact, one simple yes or no can change the world. Because it's people that change the world, not things. Not technology, not social media, as many people would have you believe, or any of the stuff that's so often elevated to a position of importance. And the reality of the matter is, of course, you don't have to be rich or famous or powerful to change the world with a yes or a no. One year, uh, one day, in fact, December the 1st in 1955, a lady called Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white man on the bus. She was sitting in the coloureds only, as it was called, area of the bus. And there were no other seats in the white section. So the white man assumed that she would just move because she was black. She said no. And her courageous decision started a chain reaction which resulted in her becoming a symbol of the rights movement in America. So when I read the passage from Luke in preparation to writing my sermon, something I'd never thought of struck me. Who are the hidden characters in the Christmas story whose yeses, yes or no's made such a ma massive story, a massive difference? Who are these people who are pivotal in God's plan for eternity? Well, we have the shepherds, don't we? A group of men out in the back of beyond with their sheep. What are their names? I don't know. The Bible never tells us who they are. They're simply called the shepherds. Somewhere, of course, there would have been families waiting for them to come home. I wonder what the hopes and dreams were of those men out in that lonely field. As far as the night the passage speaks of, we certainly know that in the short term they were absolutely baffled and terrified by what was going on. I mean, let's face it, if half of heaven rocked up on your doorstep in the middle of nowhere, you'd be pretty frightened, wouldn't you? And yet we're told nothing about these men's characters or their past. Were they good men or bad men? Were they believers or not? We don't know. Now, it seems likely they would have been low on the social ladder, of course, probably poorly educated. And what, from what we know of the history of the time, maybe not particularly well liked, because they did a manual job. They were badly paid. And if they spent long periods of time out in the countryside and amongst animals, they were probably pretty smelly as well. And yet God chose them to be the, some of the first people to see the Messiah. But of course they could have said no, couldn't they? We're a bit busy right at the moment with our sheep, so shove off. But they said yes. And then they risked everything by leaving their sheep and heading off to find the baby Messiah. And what is more, they then went out and told the world boldly about what they'd seen. Which is an amazing evangelism, isn't it? Their world must have been turned upside down by a simple yes. 
And then we have Jesus' parents, of course, Mary and Joseph. What about them? Well, at this point, they're about to loom large into the Bible story, aren't they? But we don't hear much about them later. In fact, Joseph all but disappears. And Mary's life becomes one of increasing difficulty and sadness. So Joseph, it seems, was probably a respectable man with a good job. He would have been a man probably looking forward to marry the woman he loved, planning the wedding and probably looking forward to children. And when he receives a message later in scripture from another angel and everything in his life is suddenly turned upside down. Imagine that. Imagine being told that your firstborn, the son that you'd always wanted, wasn't going to be yours. What would that have felt like? Imagine the shame which it could have been heaped upon him by people when they discovered he was marrying a woman who was already pregnant. But when the angel called, he said yes. People must have thought he was crazy, mustn't they? And then, of course, we have Mary, don't we? A young girl engaged to a good man. What did the visit from the angel mean to her? Disgrace? Fear? To have to tell her husband that she was pregnant? To run the risk of being condemned for suspected adultery? How was she going to tell her parents? But she listened, the young and frightened girl, and she said yes. And then, of course, later we will hear in our Bible story, as we move towards Christmas, about their journey to Bethlehem, when Mary was heavily pregnant. No soft seat in an air-conditioned train or car, travelling over rough country on foot, or maybe in a cart or on a donkey, to a place that she didn't know, among people she didn't know. And what of the other people in the Christmas story? What of the family and friends of Joseph in his home village of Bethlehem? Now, you see, Jewish culture sets great store on hospitality. And it seems odd that in the whole of the town, not one of jo Joseph's family could find a space for him and his heavily pregnant wife. You have to wonder if there are other reasons for them being turned away that night. The wife pregnant before marriage, perhaps. Rumours circulating and tongues wagging. What would Joseph and Mary have felt like when the last door was shut in their faces that night? As Mary's labour pains started, what would they have thought as their own flesh and blood said, no? And what of the innkeeper in our traditional Christmas story? The last hope that Mary and Joseph had. The town crammed to capacity because of the people returning for the census. But what person would send away a heavily pregnant woman on a dark night with a curt no when they, he was asked if there was any room at the inn? And so Mary and Joseph end up in a farm building with farm animals. It's dirty and it's smelly and maybe it's only a very small amount better than being outside. We don't know. I wonder if this is what they imagined the birth of their son would be like when Joseph asked Mary to marry him. That must have felt like a lifetime ago, mustn't it? Well, of course, they couldn't know, could they? They couldn't see the future, even in those dark hours before the birth of the most important baby in all of history. They had no idea what was coming. And yet, they'd made a choice, hadn't they? They'd stepped out in faith when they had the offer from the angel. And let's be clear, of course, it was an offer. Both of them could have simply said no. But if they had, what would the world look like now? The truth is, of course, actually their lives might well have been easier. Saying yes to God doesn't guarantee your life is going to be a bed of roses. But it does start the greatest adventure you could ever have imagined, with Jesus right there beside you. And let's look at the store in the story at those who said no. What of the innkeeper? What of Joseph's family? They could have been part of the most astonishing event when all of history changed. But they said no. And they shut the door when asked and went back to their ordinary lives. 
Imagine the scene a few years later when Joseph's family was at a gathering and the word of Jesus' ministry, complete with healings and miracles, got passed around. I wonder what the family were thinking then. And then, of course, imagine the conversations after Jesus' resurrection. And imagine the innkeeper. Would he be putting up, would he be drumming up some trade by putting up a plaque on his door? This was the door shut in the face of Mary and Joseph, parents of the Messiah, just before his birth. But hey, I let them use my stable. I'm not sure how much that would, good would do his business, really. But what of the biggest yes and the biggest no? What of God's choices? What of his yeses and noes? Well, God chose to say yes to us through a simple couple in love in one tiny corner of the world to reset all creation. He chose to have his son and the co-creator of the universe to be born humble in a dirty room with animals to launch a rescue mission for humanity, to teach us about mercy, humility and love and then to bring him, bring us back to him. Let's pray. Father God, we, we are in awe of the yeses and noes made by the central characters in our Christmas story. We ask that you would speak into our hearts in the soft, quiet voice of love to help us make our answer be yes. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now is time for our intercessions, our time of corporate prayer. So no responses today. Just some gaps between the prayers for you to insert your own words to God. Lord God, help us to stop comparing our Advent season this year to any other because we know that you have ordained us for this time and this place and you have works prepared in advance for us to do that only we can do, Lord. When you call, Lord, give us the courage to answer yes. Lord God, help us to find the meaning and joy in whatever life looks like because we trust Jesus in our lives. Even more, when we're seated with Christ, we worship you and take our eyes off ourselves and consider how we might serve and love you best. Lord God, when we're seated with Christ during Advent, we realise that you have sovereignty placed, sovereignly placed us right where we are for a reason. And we can trust that you know what you're doing. Finally, Lord, when we're seated with Christ, we can reiterate to our hearts that at all times, your peace, your power, your hope and your love are available to us in endless supply. As we take our seat with Jesus this Christmas, we pray our holiday tables shimmer with your glory and that any joy and hope we've lost returns. Help us to hear your voice. Touch us once again. Give us the courage to be your beloved. Give us the courage to choose joy. We need you now this Christmas, Lord, to be born in us again. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we say together the prayer that our Saviour himself taught us. This prayer being said today by billions of Christians all over the world. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
And now it's time for another beautiful carol from the Tale Valley Choir. Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I hope you enjoyed that, particularly with our special guest, the Tail Valley Choir. There'll be some more of their carols coming up on Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Day, we've got something very special for you as well, with a particularly beautiful solo carol. So whatever your week holds this week, my friends, I hope that the love of the Lord pours into your heart as you answer yes afresh to his call upon your life. And now a final blessing. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honour everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and those whom you love today and always until we meet again on christmas eve my friend on christmas day my friends even may god hold you in the palm of his hand god bless <laughs>